what? Shut your mouth, you. Oh, God. I've been lucky enough to write for a lot of comedians, but some of them really stand out. God help us. Frankie Howard was one of the most amazing characters and talented man I ever wrote for. And he was a one-off. What are you doing? Shut your mouth! Here we are. Get ready. A troubled soul in many ways. His original ambition was to be a straight actor. Fate propelled him into being a comedian. And that was intrinsic to his style. It's like there was a... No, no. I feel like... This waffling and losing the track and rebuking the audience. No, Mrs. No, just listen. Chat! <laughs> no more to drink, please. And he was immaculate. He rehearsed every syllable. The chaos that you saw was completely planned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, don't applaud. Just through concubines. <laughs> It's fascinating looking back in our television visual age. Radio was king. People would sit around at home listening to their radio. And Frank was part of that world. He was an enormous star, which led to, of course, him appearing in theatres and everything. He was a big, big name. <laughs> now look, now listen, now look. But as you all know, honestly, everything comes to a head. Besides you. <laughs> oh, tinker <think of> me. <laughs> BBC Variety Bandbox was kind of a vehicle that a lot of ex naffy servicemen, soldiers who'd been in entertainment during the war, uh, went on to. And, it was, uh, and he had little spots and little bits on it until the show host left. That really propelled him into his own vehicle. That was when he became the person who could host and hold a show together. I think Frankie Howard realised very quickly that he needed a gimmick. So he developed a style of delivery for radio that was entirely different to what everybody else was, was doing of that era, which was talking quite naturalistically and forgetting where he was and going, oh, no, uh, wait, now hang on, where was I? Listen, Wednesday last week, uh, Wednesday, I think it was Wednesday, yeah, it was only one Wednesday last week, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right, Wednesday, yeah. <laughs> When he was first trying to be a performer, a comedian, getting the words wrong became the act. That became what he was actually doing. So he would very often he'd be trying to tell a joke or trying to tell a story, and the asides and the going off on the tangents became much funnier uh, than the, the story was ever going to be on its own. The first monologue that he did on the radio, which Eric Sykes wrote for him, was about how he'd had to deliver two elephants to a zoo. Two elephants. <laughs> Two elephants. <laughs> I was the man! It was a description of him trying to get these two elephants sort of through down the high street and onto a train and to a zoo. It was obviously not true, but because it's radio, it doesn't have to be true. It was just a very funny and rather surreal image. No, but the way people stared, the way people stared. You'd think they'd never seen two elephants going down the underground before. <laughs> now, it's shocking. To listen, here, listen. Yes, ye may titter, titter ye may. How are you? Are you all right? Are you? Mm, yes. Well, I feel... Uh, um, well, nicely, thanks. Yes, love. I'm all right, but... I, I think it's quite difficult now to understand how original he would have seemed when he first emerged in the late 40s. He would come out and not know where he was. Now, what? No. Wait, where was I? No, no, no. So... He had the most extraordinary technique. He seemed to just waffle, um, and he'd keep interrupting himself with little catchphrases like, um, oh, no, missus. Oh, no! Oh, no, missus! 
You're mocking Francis. Who's mocking Francis? You're mocking Francis. Very, very funny. And they seem to sort of just spring out of nowhere. Actually, we know that these were very, very carefully scripted. He practiced these, and he actually inserted them into the scripts um, at strategic points. He knew exactly what he was doing. When I watched him perform, I always liked the way um, he he talked in a way. He talked, oh no, never, oh, I mean, he didn't need a script really. He made me laugh. Oh God. <laughs> well, no, well, I might be wrong. He was funnier than he realised. He was funny no, worry, even when he uh, wasn't trying to be funny. You, you haven't paid anything to get in, have you? You got in for nothing, didn't you? <laughs> didn't you? Yes. Well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Good. Well, I want to assure you, ladies and gentlemen, believe me, you won't find I'm wrong. You'll find it's absolutely worth it. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen... <laughs> get out. Get out. Like Tommy Cooper's props, Frank knew every syllable, but he appeared to be waffling. Oh, now, don't take a vote on it and all that, you know. Oh, no, missus. And if you titter, wrote for him... Titter ye not. Titter ye not. <laughs> there wasn't a titter from the Colonel. Nothing. <laughs> Titterless again. <laughs> If you wrote for him and you put those in, he'd say, yeah. I do those. Right. And if you didn't put them in, he'd say, where are they? <laughs> he loved wrong-footing yeah. the writers. Right. He wasn't slick, was he? That wasn't, no. wasn't his stick. He was very popular with us writers because when you started, right, you were paid by the minute of what you'd written. And <laughs> Frank could make a page last five minutes. We <laughs> like writing for Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And <laughs> there are many questions. We must face, we must face a lot of questions. For instance, is it right? I mean, should Roman Catholic priests be allowed to get married? Well, I say this, in all fairness, I, I would say this, only if they're very fond of each other. That's what I say. <laughs> But the thing is, this, you see, the BBC said to me, now, look, Francis, you must have a new image. You must have a new image, you see. They said, you must show a part of yourself which has never been seen before. <laughs> shall we, Missy, shall we find out what part we're talking about first before you start to get foreign? No. <laughs> Don't you go say you want to be a godsend. Don't you go. <laughs> Somebody said about Frank that he didn't look like a comedian or a star had walked on the stage. He looked like a member of the audience had walked on the stage. He could wear an immaculate suit and it looked as if he'd slept in it and immediately, apparently, took the audience into his confidence as if he was one of them. Frankie Howard made a point of mocking his own appearance. He would look scruffy. His shambolic appearance, his shambolic delivery, all part and parcel of this, this character of the, of the downtrodden person who was, slight, who was still a bit better than some of his audience. But, but, but could, can you believe? Can you believe what they've made me wear? Can you believe what they've put me into? He's never going to look smart, even if he was dressed up by a, by a special person. But he is going to be, well, no, you know, like that. And so that, that's what his suit was. He was naturally dishevelled. He always looked slightly ill at ease in a suit. And hair always looked just a little bit slightly too long. And he naturally had that kind of slightly hangdog look, which, which made it look like, yeah, I know. <laughs> not only does the suit not quite fit, but I know. He's not going to come in and say, I am working in the city at the moment. He's going to do completely the opposite. Would you like me to wash your window, sir? <laughs> oh, hail! Oh, you're here already. Oh, I didn't realise it was that late. I'm so sorry. Doesn't Tempest Fugit? All right, then. Off with the clubber, on with the drama. Love you! Yes, mistress, you wanted something. I'm afraid I've lost the soap again. <laughs> <laughs> Find it for me, please. You see what I mean? I have to do everything around here. Oh, well. Up Pompeii was family entertainment. 
it was naughty. It was pantomime, essentially, in that it was you could watch it on one level and just see the clowning, and on another level you could listen to the, you know, the, the grown-ups could watch the, 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 for the rude jokes, for the pantomime joke. What is your name? Tishia. Tishia. How do you spell that? With two T's. Oh. But they're not pronounced. Pardon? They're not pronounced. Oh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> It's actually a brilliant crossover between that sort of Broadway-type big setting, but very, very British comedy. Whither is thou away? Pardon? Whither is thou away? A bit. I think it's this cold weather, actually. <laughs> Frankie Howard was the perfect person to be our entry into that world, because he would be talking to us all the time, and he was a very, very modern person, in much the same way that Blackadder was very modern. They stole that, really, from him in up Pompeii, in that he's a very contemporary person who's in Roman times. So he'll often say these things like, my mind doesn't tempus fugit, and all this kind of thing, where he's sort of, you know, unpicking the education that he's required to be, to be in that time, uh, and mocking it. And, oh, can you believe it? What do you mean you've seen it before? And turning to the audience and shrugging. So he draws you in. <laughs> I wish he was sitting out there, be a godsend in the audience. <laughs> I think Al Pompeii was a success. He, he could sit there and rule the world, and almost everything was went around him. And that, of course, is how it should be with him. Would you like to see my frazzle? <laughs> he wasn't somebody I reckon would work with other people terribly well. But if the whole world was working around him, then it, then it would work out well. And I think that's how that managed to be so so good. Now, look, you must stop doing this. See someone about it now, please. <laughs> oh, yes, it's full of great jokes. Somehow that show managed to carry off being very smutty. Oh, God! But without ever really being horrible, <laughs> if you see what I mean. It was pretty risky watching, actually, because the jokes and the innuendos were quite smutty. There was an awful lot of sort of gay references in there. There was an awful lot of sort of nubile, semi-dressed slave girls in it. But because it was Frankie Howard, he somehow managed to sort of just slide that past the area of offensiveness that it might have caused. <clears throat> His ode. Behold her beauty, fine as gold, as great as Rome's fair cities. <laughs> Get ready. It attracted a whole new audience to all sorts of people, remembering mainly from Up Pompeii. It's a crazy programme, but it's, 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 he's got a great persona, the, the slave who's always interested in these, and always these pretty girls around him he's apparently interested in. Oh, be mine, be mine. No, oh, no, no, it cannot be. My husband knows all I am undone. I know, I was one who undid you. I know. <laughs> You described his career as being a series of comebacks, didn't you? Yes. Why was that necessary? He tended to have a boom and then go out of fashion quickly for some reason. Yeah. Maybe he was too positive and people thought, oh, yeah, we've seen Frankie, yeah, we know all yeah. that, the catchphrases and everything. Yeah. And then he disappeared and then the audience and the new audience were, I oh, know he's funny. Yeah. We're glad he's yeah. back, we yeah. missed him. I suppose he had to be doing just that. It wasn't like you could say, Frankie, can you play a part in a sitcom and not be Frankie Howard? He, yes. he had to be Frankie Howard, didn't he? He couldn't. Yes. I mean, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen him do anything else. No, and, and yet, it. ironically, that's what he wanted to be when he was younger. He wanted to be an actor, and then he thought, yeah. this isn't working. Yeah. I've had ups and downs, a lot of ups and downs, and I've had a lot of times when I've gone badly, and if I may say, a lot of times when I haven't been very good, and I've come off and I've missed time gags, I've done jokes. Uh, and I've got the, and I've suddenly thought, now they didn't laugh. Now, what I, my manager has gone off and said, you bloody fool, you forgot the funny line at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Frankie had a bit of a down period in the later 50s, and he diverted off into straight acting, and he played bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream. Not a whit. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue, and let the prologue seem to say, we will do no harm with our swords, and that Pyramus is not killed indeed. The problem with that is that, when it comes to it, Britain is a country that is not short of good actors. And I think by the end of the 50s, Frankie Howard didn't quite know who he was anymore. I love thee, 
Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. And yet, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. When people rejected him or when people turned him down, I think he felt that was right and proper and that was what he deserved. So when he tried for, to be an actor, tried to go to drama school and they, they turned him down, he didn't then go, well, I don't care, I'm going to press on. He thought, yeah, that's okay, that, that puts, puts me in my place. It's quite a common story for comedians to hanker after the respectability, but when they get there, they feel constrained, you know, they think, well, yeah, it's Shakespeare, but I want to say, oh, no, every now and then. He really felt kind of lost until he was re-found by Peter Cook. Peter Cook was always a fan. He'd grown up listening to Frankie Howard. Peter opened a club called The Establishment. He booked Frankie Howard. And in the middle of the act, there's <laughs> Kenneth Williams in the audience. And Frank said, you're witnessing history one comedian laughing at another. And Ned Sherin, the TV producer, was in one night and was amazed at the act and immediately booked Frank for the programme That Was The Week That Was with David Frost, which was massive at the time. And he absolutely stormed it and stole the programme. It was live and he overran and Ned Sherin just said, keep rolling. Uh, before we... Uh... This is the I'm on, on this alarm on, yes. It's about time. I've been waiting a hell of a time here to get on. It's 25 to 12. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I should have to have another shave before I got on, but never mind. That was the week that was. Kind of created TV satire oh, in Britain. He went on that at David Frost's invitation and did quite a similar style of thing of, you know, I, I don't know much about politics. Um, and it's genuinely funny. I want you, he said, to address the nation on the budget. He just sort of came on and did a topical uh, monologue. He did it with all the usual things about, so I don't know what I'm doing here, this is for university graduates, this, this, this clever late-night programme that they've, they've brought me on, and then delivered, you know, something that was the funniest thing on that series. You see, and of course, you see, Selwyn sits there in the house, apparently during the budget speech, uh, scribbling these notes. Now, why should everyone assume they're poison pen letters? <laughs> it's this gossip, and I don't understand. I, I do not approve, so I don't... Ned Sherin was a producer at the BBC who was putting together, that was the week that was, he'd seen the energy in the establishment club and wanted to get it onto the screen. Uh, and he invited Frankie Howard to come along with them, and, and uh, which led to a little part of Frankie Howard's routines where he was always sort of saying, well, I think, you know, that Ned Sherin's a nice man. Uh, no, nice, nice man, underneath. <laughs> and he, uh... So he was always biting the Ned Sherin hand. But yeah, it was a, it was a he was a great butt of uh, the Frankie Howard jokes. In these days, in any case, you can't be filthy unless you've got a degree. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, um, well... Huge viewing figures. People had never seen anything like it because there hadn't been anything like it. It was probably the fastest way in that era to to put yourself back in the nation's mind as a performer. Everyone may blames Macmillan for second half of government last year. You see, everyone blames Macmillan for second half of government, but you see, I don't. No, I'm sorry, I don't. I don't blame him. I blame her. <laughs> no, I do. It's Dot. Dot. But the style on that was the way that was. It was Harold Macmillan was in office and his wife, Dorothy, and everything, and uh, and Frank just referred to her as Dot. Oh, I blame that Dot, I blame that Dot. I mean, I went round to Downing Street, and I thought, I'm going to speak my mind here. And he, he went into some tirade, and he said, and it's not easy shouting through a letterbox. <laughs> no, obviously, no, Dotty, no, 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 well, obviously what's happened. <laughs> no, 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 stop, because no, no, no. It was only on for a couple of years, but it's still referred to, it's still often quoted as the benchmark for satirical comedy, you know. Shows still come on now and people go, will it be the new, that was the week that was? Well, thank you very much. I hope I've helped you tonight. <laughs> I 
about all that. No, because in real life, you know, oh, in real life, I mean, I look down on that sort of thing. Frequently. <laughs> Frequently, you fools, you, you fools. <laughs> The man was a mouse of innuendo and suggestion. Every apparently innocent line, he made it seem as if there was another meaning underneath. And the audience really loved that. It was as if he was paying them the compliment of, you know what I really mean. Oh, no, I've been taking singing lessons. <laughs> but, uh, yes. Dancing lessons, acting lessons, acting, yes, you know, in case anyone wants to see my Hamlet. And what else have done? But he also do innuendo and pretend not to get it. Oh, yes, yes. That was another part of the thing. Maybe because he had to. And because, was, you know, exactly. You had to do innuendo and euphemism and everything in those days. And then he re rebuked the audience for laughing. First of all, I went to Luton, to this pudding factory. <laughs> This pudding factory. <laughs> I had to give a talk to all the girls in the club there. <laughs> oh, I'd have known you to laugh, Mrs. No. That whole period where you could do camp humour, but it was illegal to be a homosexual. Yes. Well, he was lusting after the girls in up Pompeii, wasn't he? Yeah. But he still, you get the feeling that, you know, that a lot of these gay performers could get laughs around homosexuality and not double yes. entendres, but couldn't come out and say they were gay. Why not slip into something more comfortable? For instance, bed. <laughs> he was never kind of camp. He never did the sort of Julian Sandy, Larry Grayson, Hugh John Inman type of thing. He was always kind of asexual, really. Um, and, and that enabled him to ooh and ah in all directions. <laughs> what a way to have to carry around all day. <laughs> the scantily clad girl in the bikini, you go, ooh. Uh, yes. But equally, the sort of muscly guy heading for the wrestling contest, he could also go, ooh. Large knee, you got him the small of my back. At least I slice a knee. Oh, sorry, mate. <laughs> Does it, sir? Oh, no. I'm just doing this to while away the journey. I enjoyed his performance very much in Carry On Doctor. He, was, he, he, wasn't, yes. he wasn't in many Carry On films, was he? Or maybe he was Up the in Jungle, one. he was, was in. <laughs> <laughs> carry On Up the Jungle. What a clumsy <laughs> title that is. <laughs> That's enough. You get into excited. Take something, man. Take something. What? No. What's this? Pickett's muscular elixir. Easy stiffness. Just the thing. Extraordinarily British uh, oh, yes. films yeah. that, that somehow worked. What on earth happened to that poor fellow? Terrible thing, terrible. He was out beating up front, come across this mad elephant, you see. Mad elephant? Yeah, nothing more dangerous than a mad elephant. Are you sure it was a mad elephant? He's been shot. Yeah, well, have you ever seen a sane elephant using a gun? Even the... Ken Williams and Sid James, they were all playing a part yeah. in it, and Hattie yeah. Jakes yeah. and so on. But Frankie Howard in the middle of it all was still Frankie Howard. Yeah, yeah. Whoever he was supposed <laughs> to be, it was Frankie Howard in that bed in the hospital, and that was what was funny. What's going on here, nurse? Oh, sister, he won't let me take his underpants off, the silly boy. You're darn right I won't, and I'm not a boy, as you'd soon find out. He is a patient called Francis Bigger, and he refuses to take off his underwear. And Hattie Jakes, his matron, just reaches under the bedclothes and rips them off. <laughs> Which, of course, makes everybody laugh all the time, because it's just, you know, it's Hattie Jakes and Frankie Howard. I mean, it's the dream duo. I'm not a guinea pig. Oh, I agree, Mr Bigger. More like a hamster. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
On Broadway, there was a big hit. A funny thing happened on the way to the Forum with Zero Mostel starring. Zero Mostel couldn't or declined to accompany the show to England. So the writers, Larry Gelbart and Bert Shevelov, were over here and they wanted to know how to cast the leading comedian. And they had dinner with John Gielgud, and he immediately said, Frankie Howard. So John Gielgud recommended Frankie Howard for Funny Thing on the Way to the Forum. Well, that's one of the most bizarre things I've ever heard. But um, it says a lot for John Gielgud, who obviously spotted a like-minded actor and, and, and obviously fell into it, well, brilliantly, actually. Funny Thing Happened All the Way to the Forum is based on a Roman format, a slave or a servant character who acts as a go-between between characters of greater social status. The crucial thing is they have to be able to talk to the audience to break the fourth wall. And that was obviously something that he was brilliant at because that's what he'd always done. He had always talked directly to the audience, which is why that part needed to go to a comedian rather than an actor. The whole show was a big hit. This was such a success in 1963, when it first went on, that when they revived it again in 1986, Frankie Howard was yet again cast as the lead that many years later. And again, it was another success. Frank had that rare quality of almost every member of the audience thought he was talking to them. It was almost his gesture, come here, I've got something to tell you. Hey, do you like your girl? You feel the same, girl. <laughs> He's very, very good at picking up on someone who's laughing in the audience and then turning to them, focusing on them and drawing the laughter even more out. You will pardon you. When I was a gas man, I used to work for the money. There's <laughs> common as muck, that one there. <laughs> Join her over here. But also when jokes go wrong, he's not a, he, he will say, oh, well, that went wrong, that was a disaster. So he's, he's providing a self-criticism as he's delivering the act. <laughs> It's supposed to be witty, it's satire! <laughs> now, come on, pull yourself together, liberal Mrs. Liberal girl! You're liberal, aren't you? Yes, very liberal, yes. <laughs> we don't worry all about you. He would do no, the man. jokes that are round the wrong way and, and muck them up, but he'd still get big, bigger laughs doing them the way he did them uh, than if, you know, a more precise comedian, I, I don't know, techniques like Bob Monkhouse or somebody who would, you know, have a, you know, computer, Delivery, dum -de -dum -de -dum -de -dum, and always get to get it right. But um, you know, was never as funny as Frankie Howard, uh, shambling all over the place. I've, uh, but I tell you, I, I've just felt you. I sort of, I'm not, I mean, um, I feel limp. <laughs> no, don't laugh. It's wicked to not be afflicted. I feel no. He was approachable, wasn't he? You felt like you you could be watching Frankie Howard and you felt like you he you could sit down and have a cup of tea with him. No, he was so chatty. Yeah. His style was so yeah. chatty that he was him bringing the audience well, in. There was a yeah. surreal element with him as well. Yeah. But he'd suddenly he... take off in some direction. You think, where are we now? Wonderful. How dare you? I fell. Do you know I fell? I could have hurt myself. Whack thud. But luckily I fell on my head. That's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> Excuse me, we've got an hour of this, so try and reconcile yourself with it. Come on, bigger. Don't be ashamed of it. Bigger! My favourite Frankie Howard appearance is the film about Pompeii. I've seen it several times and it never, never fails to make me howl with laughter. Um, it's got all the elements of the TV series sort of ramped up a little more, so it's a bit ruder. It's got some very odd special effects in it. I say, it's rude to point. There are two things I particularly love in the movie. One is right at the beginning, there is a panning shot across what is obviously a model 
of a Roman town with Vesuvius smoking at the top. And it's quite a good model, but you are thinking, this is really obviously a model. And then just as you're thinking that, Frankie Howard's head pops up and he goes... Impressive, isn't it? It's great. They're acknowledging it's a rubbish model. I don't tell you what it costs to build. What were the price of matchboxes these days? Still, copulatum expensium, as we Pompeians say. The other thing that's in Up Pompeii is the best hangover scene in movie history. Oh, there you are, Lurkio. Frankie Howard has made mulled wine. They wake up in this villa that belongs to Michael Horton, and they've all got terrible hangovers. It makes you feel like you're in the grip of a tremendously terrible hangover. And what they do is they've put this massive echo on the soundtrack so that every sound that anyone makes is hugely amplified. So if someone just walks across the floor and you just hear this and they keep cutting to Michael Horden going like this. <laughs> and it's, it is really, really funny. Every time I watch it, it makes me feel so wobbly. It, it is the most perfect piece of um, post-drunken orgy, um, headache, vomit-inducing film that I've ever seen. Would you mind shutting the door? What were you born in a field? I once spoke to Eric Sykes, who was a sort of pioneering scriptwriter for Frankie in his early days. He thought Frankie was too big for Up Pompeii, and he, he wasn't a right vehicle for him, but I, 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 I beg to differ. Oh, ha ha! You know what you are, Mush? A pain in the neck. Oh, I know it's corny, but could you think of anything better at a time like this? Up Pompeii suited him really well. It was, a, it was a great combination of historical trauma with people in togas and stuff. But he is very much a, a man of his time talking to cameras, breaking the fourth wall. I should have kept an eye on her. I. <laughs> oh, please yourself. Very, very funny. You could see under his toga occasionally, you could see he's obviously got a vest on just to keep himself warm. He's like a real person standing up there. Oh, no! Oh, what a time to go. Halfway through the picture. Now I shall know now how it ends. I don't think he enjoyed fame. All through the years, Frank never lost his basic stage fright, the apprehension. He couldn't wait to do the act and then get off. The legendary Ken Dodd, who is the reverse, uh, didn't want to get off the stage and stayed on and on. Frank told me that baffled him. Why does Ken stay on all night, he said. I want to do my bit and get off. I had this, got it this morning, I felt awful. It's this, you know, laryngitis. And I thought, you know, because it's terrible when your voice, when your throat depends on your voice to, to, for a living, you know what I mean? It's a, it's me, th it's me throat. It wants cutting. <laughs> That's not the joke. That's not the joke. No. <laughs> so I just threw that in. I'm sorry now. I should have thrown it out again. Anyway. You have a feeling with him that he was talking about himself. There were jokes there, but you felt that he was slightly awkward about the whole thing. But then the joke, oh well. Anyway, would cover the next bit. Listen, no, I've had a terrible week. I honestly, no. I've had a shocking week, because, I mean, you don't come in to hear my troubles, I know that, but I've had... No it's always said that, you know, behind every, every clown, there is a sort of... there is a sadness inside it. It's definitely true of Frankie Howard. Um, he was a, a very, very mixed-up, depressive human being. He was um, full of anxieties, not just about performing, but about his own life. And um, he had a huge number of ups and downs in his career. The first flash of love undergoes a subtle change, and it's replaced by something more permanent. <laughs> Hatred. <laughs> there was always an edge of sadness. It's never a celebration of life. It's always, oh, this is, this is always awkward, or I'm, I'm feeling a bit sweaty, or, or no, she's, she's, she's gone wrong, or you don't know about her, oh, well, this country's going to the dogs, and oh, I shouldn't be. That, that's, and I think that did reflect his uh, attitude to life. One, I'm always asked one question. 
Do I agree with sex before the wedding? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you an I'm also asked that now. I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you a straight answer. I do not agree with sex before the wedding, particularly if it holds up the ceremony. <laughs> The Oxford Union asked Frankie Howard to speak. Frank walked on the stage to practically an ovation. He couldn't believe what was happening. And he immediately went into a torrent of catchphrases. Shut your face. <laughs> oh, no, listen. Oh, shut your face, you. Don't take a vote on it. Even the catchphrases were greeted with laughs and even applause. He couldn't believe what was happening. Oh, no! Oh, no, Mrs. Oh, no. Absolutely vintage Frankie Howard. But he contextualises it very, very cleverly. So that the first five minutes, he's, he explains why he was... Um, why he was invited there in the first place, how surprised he was to be invited. He said, I'm not an intellectual, you know. He said, I, you know, I don't read books, which, of course, immediately gets him going. Because you're all students, so naturally to you, I'm not what you call an academic. By no way at all could you call me an intellectual. Yeah, yeah. And the... <laughs> Which is why I feel so much at home here tonight. <laughs> all of a sudden, people were kind of amazed, because there he was. It, was. it was like that was the week that was. All over again, 25 years later, another generation of people saw him doing, you know, his variety hall stand-up and, and absolutely loved it. He said to me, excuse me, he said, are you Frankie Howard? I said, yes. He said, dear God, I thought you were dead. <laughs> it's a superb performance, because this is, this is a comedian who's slightly out of his time, playing to these kind of young, wealthy, smart kids, and he manages to own that room so perfectly in a way that I think many people would struggle to do. No, not on your Nelly. You shut your face, you. Oh, titty not, titty not. He had a revival, didn't he, where students loved yeah. him. But I suppose what it was was they probably seen up Pompeii as yes. kids. Yeah. Here's the man coming yeah. to, to their thing and doing the same stuff. And I think he was probably quite apprehensive before. Oh, boy, yeah. the Oxford Union and everything. Yeah. But, boy, he blossomed and he came to life when he, he was got good. on uh, there. Uh, he, was, he was clearly The reception it. he got. Up the students! Thank you! Up the well, it was just a testament to Frank that you could have sold tickets for <laughs> his memorial. It would have been sold out and been accused still outside. The church was packed and a lot of fellow comedians. And they asked me to speak. And I was a bit uh, daunted. There was a huge photograph of Frank up there looming over you while he was speaking. I don't know what possessed me, but it, it was the atmosphere of the day. We were having a laugh and enjoying it. And uh, I started saying something and then turned and rebuked the photograph. Will you shut up? I'm talking. And I thought, what have I said? But it didn't matter that day. And I don't know anybody else who's had a career with such ups and downs. He was away one minute, he was a star the next day. Nobody remotely liked Frankie Howard since. <laughs> This. <laughs> Frankie Howard was one of those exceptional figures. He just looked like a funny person. I mean, all he had to do was walk on the screen and you'd start laughing. Oh, for the moment there, I was flummoxed. I really was. My flum has never been so oxed. <laughs> it was like watching the spirit of British comedy talking to an audience as if this is what I do, this is what I am, and there's, there's something very pure about it. No! Ah! Now, I'm glad you asked, because no! <laughs> He took the seaside rudeness of the musical performer, the kind of very, very oops, whoa, but he gave it an ironic, self-analytical, self-knowing approach.
approach. He was always aware of the joke. It was a very, very modern take on a very, very traditional form. Uh, and you have all those who ask for tickets for Parkinson. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> Welcome to second best. Frankie Howard could be a stand-up comedian today. He would make sense performing uh, as, as much as he did in 1955. And I, and I think the act is completely similar all that way through. He did make me giggle with after quite often, and just some of his performances, just brilliant. Shut your faces, now he said, oh, chief. Being an actor wasn't what made him great. It was him standing there, trying to explain something in an ill-fitting suit, and the stumbling over words, and, and explaining how he, was, he wasn't very good. Just a fantastic combination of things. He couldn't help but be funny. And so far, I've got away with it. <laughs> to slay in your lane and be poetic on Twitter. Life lessons and literary stars are plenty when our live coverage of the Cheltenham Festival 2019 continues here on Sky Arts tonight from 7. <laughs>